All right, we're going to roll here. We don't have a lot of people in the room. It's okay. Holy. That means you guys get more tickets easily. I'm glad that there was stuff I yelled from Columbus here. I was just like, oh my God. Okay, so once we get the appointment, now what do we do? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about right now. And some of you have done this for a while, and hopefully this hasn't happened to you, but I have to admit it happened to me. You know, been in the business since, um, well, before some of you were even born, because uh, I'm 62 years old right now, so you guys do the math backwards, okay? And it's like, you know, man, this is the 14th furniture store I've called on. I know all about the furniture business. Car dealerships, I know everything there's about car dealerships. <coughs> And, and I've been asked, what is the greatest attribute the best sellers I've ever met have? And it's curiosity. And they never, ever, ever lose that. And what happens is we get so used to calling these people, we're not curious about them anymore. They all work the same. They all work the same. So never assume that you know, because it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. <laughs> now, you guys ever get snow down here? Snow is cold, wet, evil stuff. situation where they want to go and the shorter the time frame they want to get from point A to point B that's the more motivated the buyer that there is so again remembering the one thing that we seldom talk about is not only is this going to help you grow your business but it will help you defend your business or not only will this help you defend your business but it will help you to grow using both of those concepts right right there to get them to want to buy our plan and the first step is research. And I am visually appalled by this. This is my visually appalled face. There are many times salespeople don't do any research whatsoever before they don't make a call. And if you're in a leadership position right here, notice I didn't say management, I said leadership position. You gotta stop that, okay? Learn about their situation, and then we're gonna use this information to develop some questions to help demonstrate that you understand where they might be coming from and something about the industry. 
Now, Selling Power Magazine is a pretty cool magazine. Uh, and they used to say it takes, you know, you do two hours of research on a call. And some of you in leadership, leadership and interest said, Levy, if because of this, my people sit on their butts in the office doing 10, you know, CNAs. I'm going to spend two hours of research before each call. I'm going to say bad things about you. I don't expect them to do that. But you know what? At least go to the website. Take enough time to get some coffee. Look at the website. Look at the Facebook page. Look and see if they're in the yellow pages. Oh, never use the yellow pages. I'll bet you something. I'll bet you some of your best advertisers still do ads in the yellow. I was a jockey, you know, ate my way out of the saddle. You all know that. You can take a look at that. I can still exercise horses, though. Okay, and you know what? All I needed to do to win a race was just be that much farther ahead than somebody else. 90% of the competition out there doesn't do any kind of research before they make a call. And you go to Vegas and you have a 90% odds of winning, I'll play that game any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Get it? Head and shoulders above the car. Okay, I want you to talk to your team about inquiry, not interrogate. Remember this whole black and white movies, you know, that sits kind of, ah, we're gonna get this, you know, get it out of you right now. This is not that kind of thing. We want to ask questions, but we want to ask it in a professional way. And a lot of people that I've worked with say, you know what, this question hierarchy really does make some sense. Different types of questions and in the order that we ask them. So, fact finding. What are your three biggest strengths? Oh, before you, what is your favorite question to open a customer needs analysis with? Well, I don't want Mark, you're supposed to tell me No, come on, come on. I got tickets, come on. What's your favorite question to open a customer needs analysis? How do you make money? How do you make money? You know what, I like that, that's good. You don't have a ticket. Very robust answer in the back. Okay, what else? Thank you. Well, Dang, we haven't shot okay, I always ask what what their plans are for the weekend because for me yeah. that usually gets a mindset into who their target audience they who they think their target audience is. Cool. Okay. I've never actually heard that before in all the time I've done this, but that's an interesting thought, especially if you're a relationship seller. Anybody else have a favorite? Well, I have one. I guess you figured that out by now. My favorite is, wow, how did you get in this business? Because we're in broadcasting. Everybody has a story. We're in the job of taking stories and, and getting them out. By the way, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down the word audience, and I want you to put in Texas what we call a big honkin' X through it. I don't want you to ever refer to the people that listen or view your stations anymore as an audience. They are always potential buyers. Okay? It's a little thing, but it'll set you apart. Okay. So I, I love to find out what stories are. And people tell you the strangest things. So this is my dream. I always wanted to own this business. I wanted it in a poker game. My mother-in-law died and before she went down to down below, she made me take this business. She put it in the will and I can't get out of it. I love to hear what people say about how they got in the business. Were they jacked up about it? It's like, you know, if Walmart was hiring right now, I'd go there instead. I think that's really, really important. Fact finding. What are your company's three biggest strengths? Now, why do you think I have this in red below? How many of you have the four-year-olds at home? The three or four-year-olds who know where you can borrow them? That's because of them. See, when we get jacked up, we're, we're, well, tell me about your three biggest strengths and tell me about your three biggest challenges. Whoa, one question at a time. Because people have to focus. And they lose focus. If you think about yourself, you start getting asked, you know, the boss is asking you three or four questions at a time. It's like, whoa, back off. And so, one question at a time. Fact-finding confirmation. Man, one of the things I can't stand, and you shouldn't either, is if you go on a sales call with somebody and they say, how many locations do you have? How many years have you been in business? You should know that stuff. Yeah, so confirming. Hey, as I understand it, you've got three locations. Is that right? 
Because when you ask it like that, they have room to tell you, no, you know what, we're selling this one location, or don't tell anybody, but we're going to buy the fourth, you know, the discount tire there, we're going to buy them. By the way, the more confirmation questions you have, the smarter you sound, and the smarter you better you look. Permission. Uh, would it be alright if I ask you about your weekly sales? Now, raise your right hand. You're the right hand. Okay, yeah, honestly. Raise your right hand. Come on. Talk okay. <laughs> Pardon me? Nothing. Yes, sir. <laughs> I am not. I'm going to be afraid, or let my team be afraid, about asking math questions. My doctor asked me questions about my health that I may not want to answer, but if I'm going to get better, I've got to answer them. Okay, so this, you know, oh, I'm going to ask questions about the weekly sales of their gross profit. Yeah. I'm there to help, okay? I'm there to help. I'm not gonna go broadcasting all over town. But permission, if you're uncomfortable, hey, would it be okay if I ask you about this? You know what, you care, but not that much. <laughs> Consequences. What will happen if we don't solve the problem? Now, some of you probably already got that. When we first started customer needs analysis, it's kind of you and I. But as we get deeper into this, I'm going to change my person. I'm going to go to plural. Okay, going back to English right there. Okay, going back to English class. Yeah, I'm going to start talking about we. Not, because now as we get close to this, we're talking about a collaborative effort. And consequences. Now, by the way, look at this. This was actions. This is emotions. How would that make you feel? Versus what would you think about that? We have still never been able to put into this session down here understanding different personality types. But analyticals and drivers, which have very, very tight control of their emotions, you ask them how that makes you feel, they get you like, huh? Because they're in tight control of their emotions. And you have amiables and expressives, and if you ask them, because these people are wide open in their emotions, you ask them what they think about that, and they go, huh? Okay, so it's important to kind of get a read on the different personality styles because these two questions, if they ask, if we're asked to the wrong person, um, can kind of derail what it is you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Prioritization. You know, one of the things you find out in a customer needs analysis is that people have more than one problem. And they may give you four or five or six different ones. And just to confirm, okay, now look, you mentioned these things right here. Let's make sure that I, that I have them in the right priority. And that's what's really important. If there's ever a mistake in a customer needs analysis, it's not the customers, even if they told you X the first time, and you come back and told you Z the second time. It is our mistake. We need to shoulder that. So, prioritization and action step confirmation. Look, before I go, I want to make sure I got this right. Because sometimes I don't always hear what I think I want to hear. So this is what we want to do, right? Because again, we're trying to get them to say yes. Trying to get them to say yes. Really great questions are open-ended. Don't, don't ask me an open-ended question. What is an open-ended question? It's not just yes or no. You're right, you're right. You already have a ticket, right? Yes, I have two. Okay, well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you don't have it. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It is, there's always some what's out there that you ask an open-ended question, they're going to go, yes. Or, you know, but it's really hard, really, really hard to put a yes or no to it. They're informed. Now, what do you think I mean by informed? And source. Hey, according to USA Today, uh, as I understand it, people are about 72% more likely to buy something if a clerk takes them to what they're looking for. How does that relate to what you do? Okay, I got a source in there. It's not Mark Levy thinking about this stuff. I have a credible source and professional. When you get
get. You know, when we use four letter words, we need to have our mouth washed out. We do. Um, three letter words in mind. Peter Drucker talks about everything about business is involving attitudes and behaviors. Ergo, how and why. I add this now, because this is the kind of time of year that some of you are running into. You know, I already got my budget plan for the rest of the year. Why don't you come talk to me in January? And what's going to happen when you go in January? That money's flown away someplace, okay? So we want to get people to move now, whether they want to grow or defend. This is a huge question that nobody asks. What's your vision for you? Where do you see yourself a year from now, five years down the road? And you know, if you're dealing with drivers, they're going to tell drivers, you know, very car dealership sales managers seem to mint these people. Five years from now, I want to know about what I'm going to make the month in the next two weeks. Okay? But sometimes you've got to slow people down and say, okay, you know, where do you see yourself? Because how can I help you get where you want to be? Now, there's another couple. I am fascinated by miners. If you are brave enough to go down into a mine two miles deep and dig coal and that kind of stuff, you have more guts than I will ever, ever have. And I was glued to the, remember there was a movie that came out about the miners in Chile who were down there for like 40 days or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the interesting <coughs> thing about coal mining, if you like coal mines, is I you know, find them fascinating. You read a lot about coal mining disasters. And you know, when there's a cave in, man, everybody starts digging. They dig, and they dig, and they dig, and finally there's that one shovel that breaks through, and they know that everybody else down there is going to be okay. But sometimes, they call this off, and they say, you know what, we just don't think there's anything going to be down there. And I've often wondered, this is a morbid thought, how many times do we stop with one shovel too soon? When we are doing customer needs analysis, oh man, clients, clients worry about this time, I, I better shut up and get out of here. How many times did we stop one shovel too soon? One question too soon that might have gotten us all to the goal. And there's a gentleman who I owe a lot to. He and I were co-managers, a guy by the name of Larry Weiss. And I will tell you that I'm an impatient person. and may surprise some of you. And Larry and I would go on calls, and it's like, OK, we got everything we need. And Larry would just go, now, that's really interesting. Tell me a little bit more. He's like, oh, for Pete's sake, Larry. He gave us you know, everything we possibly and I can't tell you how many times I kind of said, well, then there's this. And it was like, holy shnikes. That was the key to all the gold in the safe. Mm -hmm. OK? So these long and deep questions, nothing more than, what else? Tell me more. But you know what? It can't be done like this. That is very interesting. Please tell me more. And people do this. It's like, ah, that's interesting. Well, let's tell me more. You know what? This is where you didn't go to Hollywood. You're here in Georgia. But you know what? Your acting chops are just as important because it's, sometimes it's not really interesting to learn, to learn about Aunt Pauline's you know, uh, oil change in pizza parlor. <laughs> but to Aunt Pauline, it's really important. Hey, hey, Paula. Here we go again. <laughs> I can't. I'm going to play this song. Next time you come in, I've got it on your song. I know the song. <laughs> <laughs> People have been singing it to me my entire life. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have this successful customer needs analysis because we're developing on something that aren't so successful, right? Yeah, thank you very much. You're at least, yes, yes, we are. Yes, yeah, you know what? Absolutely. You don't win them all. You, you know, sometimes it's like, and sometimes when you find out stuff, it's like, I really can't help you, nor do I want to. Mm. <laughs> Start with the least threatening questions. And that's why I love, how'd you get into business? I actually was with a call one time with a fellow in Louisiana, who we sat down, and the first thing I was going to said, do you have at least $10,000 a month? Because if you don't have $10,000 a month, we're not going to do any more in this meeting. <laughs> And there's none, that was another one of those cases where it was like, if you open the round up and swallow it, I'd be fine with this. <laughs> you know what? We've got to bring the wall down. We have to. Questions control the conversation. We think if we talk and we're you know, fun and good and everything else, we're the kind of, no, 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 no. 
Watch Law and Order. Watch the, is it Sam, Sam Watterson? Is that the, he was the best DA of them all, man. He got your butt on the, he got your butt on the stand and he asked questions and you would sing like a canary. You know, they had a choir behind it. If you're a mom, you understand this. Moms, moms know this better than dads do. Because moms will ask, who broke this? And, well, uh, I didn't break it. Oh, you didn't break it? No, no. Who broke it? Well, I don't know. Bird came in. What color bird? Well, it was a purple bird. Oh, with what color wings was it? Oh, and you're, you're caught. Okay. <laughs> when you ask the questions, you control the conversation. You know the funny thing about it is, too, is time is different. Because when you're asking questions and they're answering, time goes different than if they're sitting there just listening to you. And I can tell that by the looks in some of your faces right here. It's like, how's it his lunch? Okay. Keep the wall down with questions. And, and I think there is an invisible wall. And this wall exists because they know that sooner or later, you're going to try to ask them for money. Now, what happens is in many cases, they think you're going to ask them for money right then and there. And that's why I'm really big on, mm -mm. no, unless the client says, look, I got 10 grand right here. Do you want it or not? Then in that case, take the money. <laughs> but, if we're going to be, if we're going to be an asset to these people. We got to know what it is we want to do, what they want to do, and how we do it. So we keep that wall down with questions and don't start selling. Please don't start selling. So what are some areas to probe? The company, and this is where we get a lot of confirmation questions. How long have you been in business? How many locations? Tops? You know, um, things about what have you seen as the best sellers? You know, these are company questions. And then products or services. Now this is something, we don't like to use this word, but this is a great word, trigger. What is it that puts somebody in the market? Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, my wife and I have been married 37 years. Up until that, you know, we started to go out together. Um, it might surprise you to know that I didn't buy a lot of jewelry. Okay? Um, I just didn't. But I want to get engaged, so all of a sudden now that was a trigger point because you know, if I didn't give my wife an engagement ring, uh, she probably would not have it. I mean, would you? No, absolutely not. Okay, is yours a want or a need buy? That's a big difference. You know, I tried to convince my wife that we needed an 80-inch television set. We needed that. No, in her mind, that was a want buy. Okay. The most common point of entry sale. In other words, the first time people come in, what are, what are they most likely to buy from you? I think this is one that we forget to ask a lot. The most profitable item. I don't want a bunch of loss leaders. Because someone comes in and buys a bunch of loss leaders, and all of a sudden, you know, why do we offer a loss leader? Because we think people will buy everything else, but is there any guarantee? Mm -hmm. So you're losing $50 per sale. They buy 10 loss leaders, and they don't buy anything else. And I got people in there, they bought stuff, but they're $500 down, and now who are they going to blame? <laughs> Me. I don't like that. What's the one thing that separates you from everyone else? Oh, uh, you've tried the rest, and I've tried the best. No, we need to pry that out of them. And then customers. Get physical. I don't mean touching anybody. But, you know, we start asking, tell me about who your customers are. Um, and they say, well, we have everybody from, you know, two years old to death. And they're going to say that, okay? So when I say get physical, I mean, take your hands and say, okay, I, I get it, you have a broad demographic that you reach, but tell me where the bulk of your customers come from. Like, right? where's the starting age to what age? Mm -hmm. And when you use this, it helps them understand what you're talking about. Why do they come to you? What do they tell you makes them want to come here? And how do they buy from you? Do they buy online? Do they buy physically? You know, let's get some of that why and how out of that. All right. These are some money questions. Okay. Who's your biggest online in-kind competitor? Because I don't care what your customers sell. You can get it online. Anybody here calling medical? Okay. Uh, I know a lot of people during COVID whose doctors would not see them, so they started going to these online medical. And you know what? Online medical, if you have insurance, 
they're asking you to go there now, and the local doctors at your minute clinic and stuff, they're not getting that business. So trust me, online can steal a bunch of money. This is a huge money question. When you lose a sale, and it's not to an in-kind competitor, who do you lose it to? And I love to ask that question because I want to put fear in a client's mind. I want them to be afraid that they've got more money, more chances to lose money out there than they thought. You know, you go to the tire store, you walk in, and you don't buy tires. So they think you went to the competitor to buy tires. Maybe you didn't buy tires at all. Maybe you said, you know what? I can get a few thousand miles off these things, so I'm going to go get the 80-inch TV, or I'm going to go take a vacation, or whatever like that. When you start asking them about this, it spreads it and it gives you an opportunity because look, sir, madam, there is only so much disposable income in the market. People are going to spend it on something. What can we do to make sure that when they go to spend it, they understand how important the tires are and getting those tires from the are? You have a sense for what goes on in the market, okay? A lot, you're asking people, tell me, Tell me what you've been doing marketing wise. Now this morning, I got up on the soapbox really hard about asking about direct mail. And I think that's important. If you're in an agricultural area, ask how much money they are spending with 4-H sponsorships. Because they think that's advertising, but that's public relations. And you know what? A lot of people don't know the difference. But sometimes we have to Share with them. And I think one of the important questions we're free to ask this is, how do you know this is working? How, how, would, you, how would you say that these other advertising do is working? How do you know? Mm -hmm. Ask for enough to be significant. OK, you don't have to go to lunch now, because I'm going to tell you, you know, my part on this. But a little radio station in uh, where I live in Grapevine, Texas, used to cover the games for the Colorado Heritage High School. And uh, they had little packages together, you know, a couple hundred bucks. So I'm on the Chamber of Commerce up there, or in the Chamber of Commerce. And so a year ago, I get a note, because Colleyville Heritage decided, you know, we're just going to pay a radio station to broadcast the games. We're going to hire an outside firm. The outside firm said, there's a good marketing company. So they send the opportunity to sponsor Colorado Heritage Panthers. Now, the biggest package that this other little radio station ever offered had been like $600. <laughs> it was in time. Four grand. Four grand. Because I would get commercials in the radio station. I would get in-game mentions at the stadium. I would get stuff on the, uh, you know, they have a big uh, scoreboard. Uh, I did all this stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is a significant increase. Ask for enough to be significant. If you just want crumbs, guess what you're going to get? Crumbs. I, I, I have this belief. If, if I ask for $10,000 and a guy says or the woman says no, I can come down to seven, five, whatever. Showing them that I'm taking stuff out but if I'm asking for $5,000, how often do you think I'm going to get a chance to bump it up to 10? Do you think the client's going to say, oh my goodness, sir, I don't think that you're asking for enough money. I believe you should ask me for $10,000. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So ask for enough to be significant. The objectives, what does the client want to have happen? Now, how many of you have been taught to ask for a budget? You are all lying, except for you, okay? Absolutely. We've all been taught to ask, what's your budget? What's your budget? Mm. You know what? I don't want you to ask it anymore. Blasphemy. No. No. I don't want you to ask for this anymore. I want you to ask about a past customer acquisition budget. What have you invested in the past few months to get to the type of traffic or sales that you're seeing? Because guess what? If we've done a good customer needs analysis and we know that Sparky wants to go from X amount of dollars per month to Y amount of dollars per month, what he has been doing in the past is not near as important as what he's going to do now. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. 
Amen. All right. There are two reasons not to ask a client about their ad budget. They don't have an ad budget. Oh, well, yes, they do. You better come to my market. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, you know what? This morning, I shall wake up, and I shall have coffee, and I shall go, and I shall buy advertising. No. They got money for client acquisition and retention. And you know what? It's verbiage, folks. What ha it, it's not, what's your ad budget? What do you have is insight. What have you been investing in in the past for client acquisition and retention? It changes the game. And here's the other reason. No mas pantalones. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You ask a client what the budget is, and if you get a truthful answer out of that, you are a better person than I am, because they will no ball lie. Yeah, it could be your cousin Fred, and he will look you right in the eye, and he will lie straight out at Always. you. Always. Always. So I want you to know the value of the big seven. Because if you don't have these seven questions and what you use as a customer needs analysis, you ain't getting it done. Okay? Here they are. How many people come in per week? How many people buy something each week? If I know those two questions, what do I know? No, you don't know sales, you know closing ratio. You know closing ratio, okay? Now, if I know what the average sale amount is, and I know how many people we buy something, then I know the weekly sales, okay? How often do they come back to buy per year? For once in my life, I'm gonna stop just saying, you know, the only value for me is to getting people in here. If I get them in here and you take good care of them and they come back more than once a year, you know what? The amount of money that you put in advertising is doubled or tripled. I mean, the value that you get back out of it is doubled, tripled, however many times they come back. All part gross profit margin. Now, you know what? Before you go in to see the client, Google that sucker, okay? Google it. And, and so you say, ah, so, all right, uh, uh, the furniture store, national average, somewhere around a ballpark about 45%? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, is it, are, are, is it higher for you? No, no, it's much lower. Oh, closer to 30%? Well, I mean, uh, I have played high-low from somebody who wasn't going to tell me, and guess what? I have gotten in the ballpark, and that's all I want. I didn't have to pay a ticket. I got in the ballpark just by playing high-low, and I'm not nervous about this. I'm not nervous about this. It's a ballpark. All right, how much have you invested the past few months on a per month basis? I think this is really important to ask on a per month basis to get the kind of traffic sales you're seeing, and how much more month in sales would you like to do? Oh, great, Mark. You know, this is all cool and everything else, but how am I supposed to keep track out of that? Da 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 da. All right, let us see. I think we're going to have to. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. There we go. <laughs> All right. Now, if you can't see that in the back, I want you to come forward because we have built for you a spreadsheet. You get this. You're nice. Okay. Because <laughs> we're going to show you how it works. Okay. Because this is the game changer. Now let me give you a cautionary tale. You have heard it before. If you live by the numbers, you have a chance to die by the numbers. I do think this is important information for you to get. You're going to see there's another tab that you may decide to take to a client, or you may not. But if you have this information, you're going to see that you get some big muscles on this. Mm. So, anybody calling a furniture store? All the time. Okay. So I'm going to ask you then, just for uh, just for demonstration purposes here, let's take this furniture store. How many people a week come in? What did you say? Um, per week, we get about 50. Okay, 50 people. Now, I ask per week because most people, if you ask them, they have a better grip on how many per week than they do per month. But don't fear. We're going to show you how this thing calculates over for you on a per month basis. 
So we have 50 per week. Look what happened over here. That means that on a month, okay, they get about 217. Now, how did I go from 50 to 217? Because all I did was multiply the average number of weeks in a month. And if you take 52, if you rather, if, yeah, if you take 52 and divide it by 12, 4.33. Mark, am I counting my folks who come to the online? It's up to you. Okay. It's up to you. Okay. Well, so you think there's more? There's more folks than 50. In okay. terms of coming into my store, yes, but okay. online. But they're shopping. Okay. okay. They're shopping online. Okay. I'm in upwards of about 150. Okay, let's go 150. Hey, now, how many people a week, whether they're buying online, brick and mortar, whatever, how many people a week buy something? Out of that 150, I'm level close about half of them. Okay, so 75. Guess what it just did for you? It calculated the closing ratio for you. Ooh. All right, now, what's the average sale? What's the average sale about? Average sale is about. Um, let's just go ahead and call it about 1200 Okay. That means they're doing about $90,000 a week. Mm. Wow. Hang on. And please, please, may I have $500? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, furniture store. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And you know what? It's funny. It is. It is not. <laughs> okay. So, what's the gross profit margin for the store? What do you figure? Go uh, low. Shoot low. They're riding Chetland ponies. Okay. <laughs> twenty-five. Twenty-five. Okay. I think you're gonna go a little higher now. But you know what? Hey, shipping costs, everything like that. So we'll go twenty-five percent. Okay. Now, how many times does a customer go and buy, spend twelve hundred dollars in furniture a year? They do it once a year. Oh, well, most of my folks are probably coming in here about every six months, different pieces. Or something. Wow. Okay, so we're gonna say they come in here two, two times a year. Yeah, they got kids. <laughs> okay. So guess what? Okay, gross profit per sale is three hundred dollars. Gross profit per week, twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Can I please have five hundred dollars? Okay. Now. What would you guesstimate in the past six months that they have put in advertising per month? Per month. Let's go with per month. Yeah. I'm gonna do this. Yeah, just ballpark it. Uh, it's probably about two thousand. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting, folks. When you ask this question, dig deep. Mm -hmm. Now we spend about two thousand dollars. Okay. Now, does that include? All of your digital? Does that include <laughs> anything, you know? Not even close. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. And see, when, and we got to ask that. So, what do you think, what do you really think they're spending per month? 15 grand. 15 grand? Billboards, TV, yeah. radio, yeah, school. Okay, so now let's look at what we now have. Gross sales per ad dollar. And again, garbage in, garbage out. We're just playing along here, okay? But what we're seeing is for every dollar they're putting in advertising, they're generating almost $26 in sales. That sounds pretty hubba hubba, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, monthly per prospect investment. And again, this is just a ballpark, but basically it's costing them about 23 bucks to get somebody into the store or to shop with. In fact, since we're talking digital, let's say to shop with. So let's go over here. And everything that we saw over here in month calculates over here, I'm sorry, in week calculates by month. Now, this national average ad dollars is a percent of sales. If you're in radio, they have this at the RAB. If you're in television, uh, you can find this. I believe the TVB also has this. And this is a really strong tool because, you know, what we just found out over here is Levy's Furniture's spending about 
3.85% ad dollars as a percent of gross sales, but if the national average for furniture stores is 8.2%, I'm underspending. And to be able to say, look, you know, I, I know you're happy, but just so you know, this is from your industry, it appears as though we're underspending. Now, the annual customer worth, since this, these people buy twice a year, isn't $1,200, it's $2,400, and over the course of three years, it's $7,200, okay? We don't talk about that. We're just so happy that we got them in one time. Okay. Now, let's go down here. How much of a monthly increase in gross sales do you think the furniture store would like to have? Am I at right now, Martha? No, how much, more, how much more a month do you think they would like to do? Gross, gross sales more a month. Don't look. Realistically, okay, is that realistic? I mean, if you ask, I mean, yeah. Okay. Like if, you're saying, if you're saying what I can do for somebody? No, 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 I'm asking you, the client is, the client, you're sitting across from the client, and yeah. I say, look, realistically, how much more a month in sales would you like to do? So, give me a ball, give me a number. Uh, 15. Okay. One, five, zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Yes. Do you ask these questions in dollar figures or percentages? I ask dollar figures because I don't do percentage rule on my head. But you know what? If they give me percentages, you know, I gotta. Let's face it. Most of us got in broadcast <laughs> business because we weren't good at math. Okay. Why did I build spreadsheets? I built spreadsheets because my teams, uh, they were great sellers, but in turn. I would just never want anything to do my taxes. Mm. <laughs> I, I found though a lot of clients like to talk percentages because of that fact. Yeah. They don't want to tell you a number, a dollar number, so they'll say, yeah, I'm going to go up by 15, 20%. Okay. So you know what? I'm taking notes on this. This is all of my customer needs analysis. I'm going to go back. Now, if they say 15%, I have to do the math. Okay. They're doing $90,000 a week. They want to plus it up by 15%. What is 90,000 times 1.15, and that's my number, okay? But yeah, you gotta know, you gotta know how to do that. Okay. But, good question. All right, so, if we wanna do $15,000 more in sales, mm -hmm. okay, there's our new monthly desired total sales figure, 404,000, we have a new gross profit per month of 101,000, that's about $3,750 over the original gross profit. 13 more sales, and based on our closing ratio, about 25 more prospects. Okay, wow. But as Paul Harvey used to say, that's not, we have the rest of the story. <laughs> Down here, you will see that there's another tab called Justification. And if you click on that tab, trust me on this, everything that you put in over here goes over here. This is where you start asking, am I asking for enough? Mm -hmm. Because we had that $15,000 sales increase that they want. They want, okay, so what am I gonna ask for? How much money am I gonna ask for? Because we, we go off track on this. If we want people to spend another $5,000 to get to where they wanna go, they also have to cover the $5,000 we're asking for. Okay, but you know, there are other trainers out there, and I'm sorry if you've been in front of them if they're related to you. All you gotta do is ask for X amount of dollars to cover the sale. No, you gotta cover the advertising cost here. Okay, so now we have this 29 sales needed, 58 prospects needed. If you have ratings, you would put in here that the schedule would reach however many people. If you don't have ratings, don't worry about it. The question becomes, for $5,000, do you think you could get 29 more sales or 58 more prospects needed? And this is where we have to stop and think sometimes about, hey, is this legit? And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. In Dubois, Pennsylvania, because I work in large markets and small markets, we went to a coffee shop, and they gave us this information, and we said, we're not gonna use this, because in order for it to justify a $500 a week schedule, based on what they were selling their coffee for, they need to sell about 3,000 cups of coffee. 
There weren't that many people in Dubois, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but at least I had an idea. And the salesperson had an idea. And surprisingly, when we ask these questions and we're not afraid, people will tell us. And then that gives us power. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. Can you use, if, if that were the case in, in Pennsylvania, can you use that to pivot to digital sales? I could. I, and you know what? Again, do any of you have a toolbox at home? Yes. yes. Right. You know what? I have toolboxes at home and because I break things all the time. And I have some tools in there that I use all the time. And I have some tools in there that I use maybe once every two years. But when I need it, I know it's there. And that's what this is. This is a tool. And you may not need it all the time. You may decide, mm -mm. But if you don't ask those big seven questions, which I got to do, don't yell at sales, then you're shortchanging your client, you're shortchanging yourself with an opportunity to ask for bigger money. Because if I can go to a client and say, look, you said you wanted $5,000 more a month, or $15,000 a month in gross sales, based on what you said. Because if you lied to me, then you know this is off. But based on what you said, this is what the math looks like. Let's do it. Okay? Question? And you're saying that where you have the number of, as far as the station number of reach and width in the schedule, mm -hmm. why is that part so optional when it's been ingrained in us that that is very much important in terms of the schedule you put together? I'm so glad you asked that because some stations don't subscribe to ratings and some, you know. So if you have ratings and you know what the reach and frequency of the schedule is going to be, that's great. I don't like gross rating points. There's a reason they call them gross. Okay? Yeah. I've never seen a gross rating point buy anything. I've never seen an impression buy anything. However, putting it in there, to me, you know, again, if you have it and you know that the schedule is going to reach 38,000 people, the evidence suggests that we'd be able to do that. One other thing about if you're talking about how many people, oh, I said the wrong word. If you're talking about how many potential buyers a schedule would reach, use pictures. How many people can fit into, uh, where, where do the Georgia Bulldogs play? What's in the stadium? Sanford. 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 I'm sorry? Sanford. Sanford. Okay, so how many people does that stadium see? 95,000. Okay, so you talk about reaching 38,000 people. You have a picture of the stadium. Say, imagine you know, filling up a third of the stadium and telling people X amount of times why they should come buy furniture from you. Everybody, every market in town has a smaller venue. Maybe it's a high school stadium, maybe it's, but use pictures. Because when we talk about 10,000 people, 5,000 people, we don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so help people visualize that. Okay. Anything else on this? We're trying to get you out of here on time this time. <laughs> I made no promises. <laughs> What are you doing to increase, increase your closing ratio? That's a fair question to ask. You know, are you hiring Mark Levy to come in? By the way, I would love to come down and work with your clients. I'd love that a lot. What are you doing to boost your average ticket? Man, we worked with a jewelry store, and it, it was like, Jerry Lee's. And Richard was like, I don't want any more new people in here. I can't handle them. I can't, you know. Okay. So, lesser salespeople would have walked away. My team came back to me and said, all right, do something. I said, no, you do something. You go in there, and I want you to look around the store and talk, and just take a look at what they could put next to the cash register for impulse buys. Mm -hmm. And they had that jewelry, ladies, you've seen that jewelry that, you know, when guys screw up, we buy it, and we give it to you, and it turns your hand green in about a week. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like 30 bucks a throw, and we said, look, we want you to do an in, you know, in-store contest Giving out lottery tickets every time one of your salespeople sells one of these things, boosting your average ticket by 20 bucks. At the end of the month, he came back and said, no, I thought that was you know, hogwash, but he said, that really helped. So ask him, what are you doing to increase your average ticket? Mm. It's really helpful to know what share of the XYZ market they think they have and you know, these three things right here are the only ways for you to grow your business. Get new customers, get them to spend more with you, and get them to buy from you more often. 
And so <coughs> if that works for us, I think it's a good idea to ask the clients, you know, what do you think would be the easiest thing to do? Before you leave, do you have an agency? I was taught early in my career that's the first question you ask, and now I would bury that question to the very, very end. Because if they think you know what it is that you know, there's a very good chance they're going to buy from you direct. Um, oh, this looks really good, but now I'm going to take it to my partner. <laughs> so you know what? If you like this as well as I think you, do, you will, is there anybody else we need to have involved in the paperwork? Which is basically saying, you got the power, you ain't got the power. Because if I come back, and by the way, what do I always bring with me when I come back? I always have my customer needs analysis with me. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. I, uh, that's good. I got to talk to my partner. I'm going to do one of these things. I am so sorry. When we got together, I, I, I must have misunderstood because when I asked if there was anyone else that needed to be involved in paperwork, you said no. So I thought you had the authority to move forward with this. Did I miss something? You. Yeah. Did you read it? Okay. okay. Never, never, never let more than five business days go between the time you do the customer needs analysis and the time you're coming back. And so right then and there, if I'm there Thursday at 10, 10, I'm going to ask. How about same bad time, same bad channel? And I'm always doing the 10 after, always doing the 10 after because it sticks out. Before you leave, who buys? What do they buy? Where do they buy it if they don't buy it from you? Why, when, and how? And I'm big on this. Not eight and a half by 11, but eight and a half by five and a half. Uh, I didn't bring one with me, but if you ask, I will send you a sample customer needs analysis that we do. And we suggest that you actually make it into a little booklet. Yes, it's going to be four pages, but it's eight and a half by five and a half. The reason is, if you go down with a customer needs analysis, and I do think you need to have the form, okay? Because I think even. If you're really good, you, if you don't have some kind of form, you kind of forget. And sometimes it even makes it, you, oh my gosh, I almost forgot to ask this, and it's so important. It's theatrics. Okay? Um, you can hide it easier. I use, uh, yeah, there we go. See, when I go out with your sales team, I use this. I put that little puppy in there. And it's, it's small, and they can't really see how big it is. And because if I go in there with like a couple of pages stapled together, it's like, be gone, Satan, go away. I have time to do this. Mark, I have a question for you. Yes. I know everybody has to get out of here, but I can't do that. Um, what about your sales team? Do they have to have a digital form of note taking? Is that something you sort of feel like is. You know, I. I'll go a step further. There are times if you are in a leadership position at the station, I would suggest you actually tell your salespeople, I want you, because you can't be on every call, I want you to put your phone on record. And no, I'm not going to tell the client that I'm recording you, but I want us to come back and talk about what went on. I'm clumsy, and I type really bad, okay? So I'm still probably more of a no taker But it's, it's your level of comfort. And it's the client. Is it, you know, would the client get hinky if you pulled the laptop out? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Because I've had other salespeople say, you know what? I type really badly. I take bad notes. I can't read them. So I'm going to just put the phone down and record the conversation. I think that can be a little ugly. But I do think that from time to time, if you are coaching others, you need to hear what goes on, and the audio doesn't lie. So remember. Speaking is all about and only about the prospect. It is not about you. Find your questions, customize your questions with research, drill deep. What else? Tell me more. The more information you get, the better the recommendation you can make, you can make because you said. The more you tell, the less you sell. Amen to that. Questions. Bring down the wall. It's better to. What is it? So it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. <laughs> Unless you have a couple of ex-wives. However, it is better to have that list of questions and not need them than to need them and not have them. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sort of all ages, as I understand it, it is lunchtime. 
If you would like these slides and you haven't already given me your card, give me your card and I will give you the slides, okay? Now, I know there's going to be a lot of things going on afterwards, lunchtime, there's probably some place in this where you can go watch a football game afterwards, but I'm promising you, we are, yeah, yeah, this is going to be, this afternoon is going to, it's going to rock, so come on back. Thank you, Mark. You're all right.